And then uh, there is uh, um, another uh, designer. She is, uh, also has a, a double nationality, Simone Nikie, Swiss, Dutch, uh, is a designer and researcher based currently in Amsterdam. As a graphic designer, Simone Nikia produ uh, produces objects, films, images, and strategies around themes such as personal data and the representation of the human body in virtual space. She teaches design research at Artes, uh, the University of Arts in Arnhem. Simone was already uh, a guest uh, at AZ Night number two, from Pact to Act in 2017. In 2018, she was commissioned uh, as a contributor to the Dutch Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial. Simone Nikia. Vergeten af te zetten, hè? <laughs> Does this work? Yeah. Um, yes, so I will speak quickly um, about a project that I've developed during this year, which is called Homeschool. Um, it started with an essay I wrote called um, Regarding the Pain of Spot Mini. And Spot Mini is this robot that you're looking at here. Um, Spot Mini is developed by Boston Dynamics, which I don't know if some of you are familiar with, sort of a Boston-based company that grew out of MIT, as so many of them do. Um, at MIT, it was called Leg Lab. So uh, the, the founder of um, Boston Dynamics was really interested in how to make um, you know, either a human leg or an animal leg balanced by itself. So something that is really obvious um, to us as human beings. Um, actually being really difficult to instill into a mechanic be being a mechanic tool. And the pain regarding the pain of Spot Mini really is based on scenes like this, um, where I was interested in... So Boston Dynamics really advertises their robots by sort of lo-fi videos like these on YouTube. Um, sort of purposefully, I think they play into meme culture. At the same time, also the technology that they're portraying is so high that the videos can be that bad. Um, so I think the sort of distinction is super interesting, but at the same time, you know, sort of the, the robot falling on the banana to me feels really violent. You have the sort of empathy um, towards the robot, even though you're not quite sure why you're supposed to. Um, and there's another video that I'm not showing tonight where there's a guy hitting it with a hockey stick um, to sort of make sure that, you know, this is how robust this robot is. It can get up by itself, etc. So for me, the, the question was sort of borrowing Susan Sontag's um, essay regarding the pain of others regarding the pain of Spot Mini really being, you know, is it is it the pain of us, as in whoever sort of qualifies as humans, um, watching this robot and feeling a certain empathy towards its pain that it may or may not have? Or in the video of the door, and I think here, for me it was much more seeing a robot um, acting in a space that is built to human scale. And they're actually questioning what is this human within human scale, right? It's always sort of a standardized human body um, that even this kitchen is designed for. And the robot is sort of has this arm to try and interact with these spaces as well. Um, and I think that for me was really the pain that I was looking at. Not only the exclusion of the robot, but very much also um, the human within this. So, you know, the way uh, th this robot, at least, sort of navigates and interprets its environment is via computer vision. So this, this idea that a camera doesn't know what it's looking at. Um, so you really need to, to teach um, in computer vision um, what it's actually seeing so that it can interpret and navigate the spaces that it moves around. So for me, sort of seeing the robot navigating this, this human scale world, I was curious, right, like how do you train this thing that this is the door, this is the, the, the stairs, whatever sort of objects um, are in this domestic space. Boston Dynamics being a private company, you don't have access to any of that training data. So all I had was this video of this house that we see that it goes into. Um, and I mean, that house really clearly is in a warehouse, so it's not an actual house. It's a sort of scenography, like a film set, not for this film, but very much for the camera of the robot, right? For the computer vision system of the robot to test it and to see how, how well it functions and to then show that to the potential customers. Um, so what I did is sort of rebuild this house um, 
to try and understand it spatially, to, to try and sort of, you know, visualize the data set that might have been used to train this computer. Um, what was really interesting is that I didn't have to model anything um, to remake any of the furniture or the house itself. And I think for me that really, I mean, with not having to model anything, I mean that most stuff I could just download from SketchUp, uh, the SketchUp warehouse. And I think for me, you know, that wasn't a sign of being lazy, but much more pointed towards that's how standardized the, the whatever objects um, that the Boss Dynamics chose were as well. Here you're looking at um, a Sears catalog, which, you know, is, is sort of a bunch of houses that you could literally order from a catalog um, in America after the, the Second World War. Um, and is a lot of what sort of suburbia looks like. And the house um, in the Boston Dynamics looks really similar to this. At the same time, most of the furniture, um, like you see here, were IKEA objects, um, which exist in multiples in the SketchUp library. So I was really curious to this, this sort of mirroring of the multiplication in the real world versus how it exists in SketchUp, so freely available. So I'll switch here. So when I say computer vision, um, what I'm really interested in is that I think for, for us, you know, this image is more or less clearly a cat in a monkey suit licking a banana. Um, if you try to teach this to a machine vision algorithm, how would you define this? Like, you know, is it a cat in a monkey suit? What's a monkey? What are these fruits around it? Um, so it gets much more complex what you're looking at. So whereas as human beings, we really know how to sort of you know, figure out all of these signifiers and, and sort of make sense of the complex world. So again, th the question, how would you go about teaching something like this? Um, Boston Dynamics ha being, again, a private company, not having access to that, and I was like, well, what other developments are there like this? Um, the biggest ones being done in academia, you actually do have access to. Um, and the biggest one, the biggest data set is called CNET RGBD. And that's currently being developed by the Imperial College in London and supported by Dyson. I don't know if any of you know Dyson, the vacuum cleaners. It's the same company. Um, the James Dyson, the founder of the vacuum cleaner company in 2014, said that, you know, we have the hardware to make all of these robots, but what we don't have is the software. So we don't have enough data um, of the real world, sort of a portrait of the world, to teach um, to robots to make them, quote unquote, intelligent enough um, to have them, you know, operate on their own. So he was interested in, in actually um, funding the Robotics Vision Institute at Imperial College to, you know, at some point be able to commercially also produce hardware that will be intelligent enough um, to do whatever tasks um, one would need. Um, CNET RGBD is interesting. It is only made out of 3D objects. So until now, a lot of um, data sets that, I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, often use JPEGs. Um, 3D objects are much more interesting because you can create multiple scenes with the objects themselves, so you're not based on one image only. And at the same time, you don't have to segment what's in the image. And what that means is, like again, with the, the cat and the monkey suit, you know, like a human laborer, would literally draw and sort of say, this is where the cat begins and this is where the monkey suit starts. And you'd like color in all of these areas to know what the different uh, bits of information are in the image. With 3D files, you don't need to do that anymore because the file itself is already labeled. The way you place it in the scene um, sort of circumvents that. And I mean, this is labor that's being done in really um, awful conditions, uh, really badly paid but at the same time, it's still really expensive for these companies that are trying to get this work done. Um, so seen at RGBD for one, 3D data, and two, it's trying to mash up, I mean, where do you find 3D models, you know, enough sort of thousands of 3D models um, to have some sort of average uh, of a portrait um, of the real world, and this is where a lot of the questions come in. Um, you know, again, it becomes sort of sketch up and it becomes gaming assets. Um, so the world that this paints is really a reduction um, of the world that probably we all live in. Um, plus, the domestic space is really subjective, so how do you generalize that? And this is a lot of the struggles um, that I was interested in trying to question and uncover by actually making these um, data sets visible, because normally they're not, right? Normally they're part of a, a development process and then it somehow ends up in a technology. What we're looking at here is the way that the, that the database um, categorizes rooms. So to say every domestic space has these five categories, so bedroom, office, kitchen, living room, bathroom, 
which I think for me already comes with so many questions, right? Like, I mean, does a house really need to have a kitchen to be a domestic space? Um, do all of us really have, you know, an office and a bedroom and a kitchen in all of our spaces? So ag again, I think certain assumptions that are made um, about domestic spaces and the way that they're actually encoded into future technology is really crucial. Um, here, this is basically a list of all of the objects that would have a probability to appear in these rooms. Um, and this all comes from research papers. And I mean, a lot of my research ends up being this, sort of scrolling through boring looking PDFs. Um, but look, sort of looking at them with the eye of a designer, I find super interesting because for me, this is more of a design, not visually, but the way that you know, they're trying to architecturally um, build a space rather than, than an engineering problem. And the, the arrows point to mailboxes, um, and that's something that comes back in the movie where the engineers were incredibly upset that mailboxes appeared in all of these indoor spaces. And that simply was because mailbox was categorized as box and you know, not as something that's in the outdoors. And this sort of glitch, I think, was really a pointer to how these categories might feel fine and might seem right. But you know, there's so much space that's sort of ignored, uh, that's cultural heritage that you know, doesn't really fit in these spaces. And same here, this is um, besides sort of the 3D objects, they were also automatically textured. So any 3D object that doesn't have a texture is just white. Um, here to sort of gain the next step in photorealism, as, as the researchers here called it, they also had another batch of files, which were JPEGs, that they would apply to these 3D objects. And here, um, what for me was interesting is top right, which is this office here. And most of the textures, I don't know if any of you recognize this, but this is Fox News, sort of the uh, right-wing television station in the US. And um, all of the textures that would be used for TVs were Fox News. And again, that's something that on the one hand can just be an accident. Um, it's not so much about that being you know, malintentioned, but it still points to how these data sets are put together. They aren't so much seen as a political problem or a cultural philosophical question, but much more as an engineering question. So you end up with something that is deeply politically colored, but maybe that wasn't the intention. And I think that's where a lot of the, I mean, for me at least, challenges and dangers come from with technology and the way it's developed in an in engineering vacuum. So the, the final film is called Homeschool. Uh, this is an installation shot, the way it was shown at um, Radialsystem. And it's, it's trying to unpack this data set. Um, so I've sort of built a world with all of these assets, with these 3D um, objects. And you sort of move through it as a first person. It's quite unclear who you are or what you are. Um, and you kind of follow this thing as it's trying to name the world and sort of try to live in these ambiguities. And so also play into this idea of language as well, of like, you know, do we all agree that this is a chair or is it an object for sitting? Or like, when is the floor also a chair? Sort of questions that feel really banal, but actually become really crucial when we try to name things that are supposed to be a knowledge base for, for another sort of being that's supposed to cohabitate. So this is sort of a cut of this scene that I've built. The only things that aren't from the database are these sort of random um, Magritte paintings that I've put in there. And I'll end with a quick trailer of the film. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Uh, are there questions of uh, the public? <coughs> uh, 
We are not going to elaborate a lot on uh, every project, but uh, a quick question. One for the road. <laughs> no? Um, I want to go then for one. <laughs> uh, what was uh, the weirdest that you found in these databases? Uh um, yeah, I think weirdest is difficult. I mean, there's yeah. a bunch. I think the, the TV was pretty strange and the mailboxes. Um, but other than that, it was more in the categories that existed and how many objects of them th there were. So for example, there is a category guns and there's a category rifle, which is already discussable if that is a d domestic category, right? Um, and with the knives, for example, there were a lot of sort of medieval bloody knives and things like that. Um, so I don't even know if that's surprising or if that's to be expected, knowing where the data comes from. Mm -hmm. So I think also while looking, I went back and forth with, you know, oh, this is wonderfully absurd and oh, that's actually maybe not that mm -hmm. absurd, but something that is exactly the world that we're, that we're building with this sort of data. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe in the meantime, yeah. Mm. This is looking at the U.S. I tried to, to give it for the rest of the public. This is one part of the world, but uh, this would be... Um, I was thinking about the region, no? And yeah. Is there, did you also find regional or other regional, like African or Asian? Uh, yeah, because yeah. there's completely different, different living, of course. Exactly, and I think that's... I mean, one of the things that I'm personally interested in why I'm doing this, um, this data set is developed in the UK, but it still looks like a data set from the US. Um, I mean, you see this on, on the TV screen, the mailboxes as well um, look like US mailboxes, with like the little flag. Um, so th there are, you know, cultural colors within these data sets that are very Western, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, I can only speculate on why, probably because of the sources of where they got the data from is also really Western, which a lot of it is SketchUp um, and games. Um, the, this is one of the questions I asked to the researchers as well. How do you deal with this in terms of the objects themselves, but also the language? Because the language is always English that's used for these data sets to categorize um, objects. So already there, there's a limitation, right? Where maybe chair, I mean, we can use any word, but like isn't actually that word, and there's many more ways of, of talking about a certain object in a different language, or maybe it's context-based. Um, I mean, they didn't really have an answer except for diversify, which I think is a general um, sort of answer, also talking about racial bias within training data sets for face recognition, where it's about we just need more data, and that's sort of gonna solve uh, the problem and fill these gaps. Um, I mean, I'm personally skeptical of that, because I do think the issue actually lies in trying to generalize. Like the, the more specific they try to be with any of these questions, um, the better they would be at trying to answering it. Um, and the more you're trying to generalize, it, I think it gets incredibly difficult and you sort of end up with, you know, the maps, not the territory. Like you can't sort of rebuild um, the world. Otherwise you end up with such a complex, insane amount of data that that doesn't work either. Um, and so now they're trying to work with a Chinese startup to use that sort of uh, architectural data. Um, but looking at that data set as well is something what I'm doing now, and it actually looks really similar. It's just better resolution, like the data is built better. Um, and again, I can only speculate, sort of, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to, um, they're not architecturally built um, apartments that these models then come from, from the, from the Chinese database, but they're from a developer. So, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe you're then in Pinterest land where you're trying to build a certain, um, uh, apartment that actually maybe has nothing to do with the culture. I don't know. I mean, these are only speculations, but I mean, exactly, I think, what should be talked about with these data sets, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? No, thank you. What, Rita, what came out of your data set? Not much. No, uh, my data set, uh, the, the data set exploded like the the one that the Earth is locked into with all the different languages, and I think uh, you can't compute this. I, at least I can't. So yeah, and then there's the the, the computer, the laptop with the chair, <laughs> and the chair. And I'm a chair. I'm a chair. Who's a chair? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe Simone knows. Uh, yeah. Uh, stupid. The mailbox house. I don't even know why I drew this. 
<laughs> the cat with <laughs> was laughing so hard. I had to include it, but I didn't got a joke for it. So, yeah, w this is the cat. This is the monkey. This is the fruit. Doesn't make sense. Cat is no fruit. I have difficulties with data sets too. <laughs> uh, I love the the the, b the robot. Uh, how do you like my interior? It's pretty bland. Yeah, but you should see the grid. Oh, <laughs> go deep there. Uh, and then yeah, I process there for I am. <laughs> Thank you, Simone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Vida.